Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 31 through 46. Please listen for the word of God. Many people were coming and going, so there was no time to eat. He said to the apostles, Come by yourself to a secluded place and rest for a while. They departed in a boat by themselves for a deserted place. Many people saw them leaving and recognized them, so they ran ahead from all the cities and arrived before them. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. Late in the day, his disciples came to him and said, This is an isolated place, and it's already late in the day. Send them away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat for themselves. You buy them something to eat. Should we go off and buy bread worth almost eight months' pay and give it to them to eat? How much bread do you have? Take a look. Five loaves of bread and two fish. He directed the disciples to seat all the people in groups as though they were having a banquet on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them, broke the loaves into pieces, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Everyone ate until they were full. They filled twelve baskets with the leftover pieces of bread and fish about 5,000 had eaten. Right then, Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake toward Bethsaida, where he dismissed the crowd. After saying goodbye to them, Jesus went up onto a mountain to pray. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the meditations of all of our hearts, and the words of my mouth be acceptable and pleasing in your sight this day. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, Jesus was tired. He was exhausted. He and his disciples had just been through a meat grinder of a trip. There was lots of walking, lots of working, lots of teaching, lots of healing. On this trip, Jesus fought demons. He raised a woman from the dead. He tried to get what little sleep he could on a fishing boat, but a violent storm interrupted him and woke him up. So he performed another miracle and calmed that storm too. Jesus and his disciples then went into Nazareth and they split up two by two and they walked all around the city throughout the day, even into the nearby villages. It has been a long trip. And as Mark tells these stories, each little story, each little event is introduced by the same word. Immediately. Immediately, Jesus speaks. Immediately, Jesus heals. Immediately, Jesus teaches. Immediately, Jesus travels. The Greek word for immediately appears in Mark's gospel over 40 times. Jesus is active. He's busy. He's on the go. And as Jesus and his disciples are rushing from place to place, performing miracle after miracle, moving from speaking engagement to speaking engagement, Jesus gets a, a phone call or whatever the biblical equivalent is, and he finds out that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been executed, killed, beheaded. And this is where today's Scripture picks up with a devastated, tired Jesus and an equally weary band of disciples. The Scripture begins with Jesus inviting his disciples to a quiet place for some much-needed rest. Jesus and the disciples have had no time for themselves, not even to eat, and so they carve out this time to get away from it all. They go away, and this is a direct quote from Scripture, to a deserted place by themselves. And they find 5,000 people there waiting for them so much for rest. 
Friends, there are some moments in Scripture that are so bizarre, so culturally specific that modern readers like us just can't relate. This is not one of those moments. We all know what it means to be tired. We all know what it means to be overworked. We all know what it means to be stressed. We all know what it means to be in need of a break or a vacation. We all know what it is like to want rest, but to be unable to slow down because of life's circumstances. It does not matter how old you are. You know what this feels like. Young people today are busier than ever with demanding homework and schedules packed with extracurricular activities and service projects, some with jobs even, and then the ever-increasing ever demands of school. Those in the workforce certainly know a thing or two about being tired. These days, a 40-hour work week feels less like the ideal work-life balance and more like the bare minimum. For many of us, a day off does not mean less work. It just means a tighter timeline. Some of us felt that this past week. In the last pre-pandemic year, working Americans left a record 768 million vacation days completely unused. They just sort of let them drift away and disappear. Because vacationing is hard when you're busy. And for many of us, when we do go on a vacation, it takes half of the trip sometimes to decompress and to feel as if you are actually resting. And I've talked to enough retired folks to know that life doesn't simply slow down then as much as you would think. Schedules tend to fill up pretty fast. So forgive me if I read a bit of fatigue into the words of Jesus and the disciples this morning. Forgive me if I hear a little bit of frustration and angst in their voices. This was supposed to be Jesus' time to rest and to grieve, and now he has got 5,000 people to tend to. Scripture tells stories of Pharisees and even Satan testing Jesus. Here it is as if the world is testing Jesus. Jesus needs to rest. He needs to care for himself uh, but also, he's got 5,000 people to tend to. So what will it be? Jesus, what are you going to do? If Jesus' disciples had their way, Jesus would have said a few cursory words, given a tight little stump speech, and gotten out. Uh, Jesus asks the disciples, or the, excuse me, the disciples ask Jesus to, to send the people away, let them eat. The disciples are looking for a way out. But Jesus is looking for a way through. He is looking for a way to honor the 5,000, to honor the disciples, and to also carve out a little bit of time for self-care. Jesus is looking to thread a tight needle. And Jesus' response here teaches us exactly how to thread that needle. Jesus teaches us what it means to work and what it means to rest. He teaches us the importance of a work-life balance in a world where 5,000 people are always asking for something. Jesus teaches us how to work hard and how to rest generously. Friends, the first thing Jesus does is honor the people. Every step of the way, Jesus honors the people before him. Jesus honors the people. He honors the demon-possessed man on his trip. He honors uh, the hemorrhaging woman, the tired disciples. With every action leading up to this passage, Jesus honors people. He cares for people. This is what Jesus does. He cares. He cares for the 5,000. He cares for his disciples. Even when he is nailed to the cross, Jesus cares for the thieves next to him. And even as he takes his dying breath, he cares for the people executing him. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Jesus cares for them, and he cares for us. Jesus cares. Friends, so too are we called to care. God has called us all to the work 
of caring for one another. And that word work is intentional because Scripture never gives us a blueprint for life without responsibility or work. It's just not there. God calls each one of us toward the work of caring for creation. Even in Genesis, before the fall, the first image of humanity, the image of us at one with one another and at one with God, is an image of labor. In Genesis 1, God breathes life into the first man and into the first woman, and God blesses them. And in God's blessing, the first divine words uttered to people, God gives humanity a job description. Be fruitful. Take care of the earth. Take care of the fish and the birds and the animals on the ground. Take care of the plants. Eat what you need. Sustain life. Friends, let this filter guide you as you go about your work and as you go about your lives. Ask yourself the following question. Does what I am doing sustain life? Does what I am doing sustain life? And when you ask yourself that question, think creatively about the ways that may be so. How do your actions sustain your own life and the lives of others? I know of a man who works in in finances, sitting at a desk, crunching numbers all day. A couple of times I've asked this man about his work and his face just lit up. He loves his job. I may see numbers, but he sees stories. He sees the impact of every dollar spent and the way that every cent allocated changes lives. Because he works for an organization he believes in, and he knows that his work matters. So ask yourself, with everything that you do, am I sustaining life? Am I sustaining my own life, and am I sustaining the lives of others? If the answer is no, maybe you should be doing something differently. When Jesus sees the 5,000, he has compassion on the people, and he acts in the most life-sustaining way possible. He teaches, he feeds, he nourishes Jesus sustains life, and he does this not only as God, but he is also living out the basic job description of what it means to be human. If you were to peel the miracle out of the story, you are still left with a powerful lesson of what it means to be human. It means being tired and weary and still caring for the people you are with. Back to Genesis God creates us, God blesses us, and God gives us this job description for what it means for us to be human. At this point, you would expect God to say, now go on and live into that work. But that's not what God does. Instead, God steps back, and God looks out over all of God's work. We haven't done anything yet. God looks out over all of God's work, and God calls it very good. And then there is night and there is morning, the sixth day. On the seventh day, God rests. On the seventh day, God rests, and God asks that we rest too. Before we've worked, before we've done anything to deserve it, God gives us rest, and God calls it holy. Friends, rest is holy. So many of us need to hear that, so let me say that one more time. Rest is holy. God knows you cannot sustain others unless you sustain yourself, so God makes rest part of the job description too. If we are about the business of saving lives, then we'd better start with our own. This is something I struggle with personally, and I know that I am not alone. It is all too easy for us to focus on the lives of others without considering ourselves. It is all too easy for us to focus on the 5,000 and to neglect our own bodies. 
there's a movie called Unbreakable that plays a little trick. And the trick is this. It's a superhero movie, but you don't know that it's a superhero movie until the movie's almost over. And so then most of the movie is uh, Bruce Willis discovering that he is, as the title suggests, unbreakable. And there's this scene where Bruce Willis is in the garage of his house, just him and his son, and Bruce Willis is working out on the bench press. He's got 25-pound weights to each side, which is what he normally lifts, and he's working out, and he's doing it just fine. And so his son decides to add a little more weight to the bar, and again, he lifts it no problem. His son adds some more weight. He lifts it. His son adds some more weight. He says, that's too much. Can you take that off? So his son pretends to take the weight off, and he just adds more. And again, Bruce Willis is able to lift the weight. Soon they run out of weights completely, so they look around the house, and they rig paint cans to the bar, and they tie sandbags onto it. Whatever they can find, they connect to this bar. It looks dangerous now. It is dangerous now. So Bruce Willis has his son step back, and he grabs the bar, and he steadies his breath, and then he begins to lift more weight than any man his size should be capable of, because he's a superhero. He's unbreakable. Friends, we are not superheroes. We may think we can handle all of this weight and responsibility, but eventually that weight will catch up on us if we do not take the time to rest. Eventually that weight will collapse on us if we are not careful. We expect excellence in all that we do, and that's good, I, I guess, but it's not enough, is it? It's not enough to be excellent at your job. You've also got to be an excellent spouse and an excellent neighbor and an excellent daughter and an excellent student and an excellent grandparent and an excellent Christian. And you pile up all of these weights. You pile up all these things that matter. I hope you hear that. They matter. You pile up all these demands, each time adding another weight to the bar and eventually you will buckle. You've got to rest. You're not unbreakable. Even Jesus Christ breaks. That's kind of what he's known for. You cannot care for the 5,000 or the 500 or even the 5 if you do not care for yourself. Deepak Chopra is quoted as saying, when you heal yourself, you heal others. And he says the reverse is also true. A wise member of our own congregation once told me that taking care of yourself is not selfish. In the long run, it is the greatest gift you can give others. Friends, rest is holy. Rest sustains life. Rest sustains us so that we can in turn sustain others. So friends, I hope that you are able to rest. I hope that you are able to care for yourself, to sustain your own life, because ultimately that is the only way that any of us can do the work we are called to. Jesus knows this. That's why he and his disciples try to get away in the first place. Jesus is tired. He's weak. He's weary. His disciples are too. They need rest. They don't plan to see 5,000 people. But they do. So Jesus teaches the 5,000. He sustains life as best as he can. And when he is finished, his cup is empty. He's fed others, but he himself feels malnourished. Most of our time, this story ends there, but it neglects the exhaustion angle altogether, right? The version of the story that we're used to goes something like this. Jesus feeds 5,000. It's a miracle. Wow, you go, super Jesus, on to the next one. But a close reading of Scripture shows us that this is not the end. There's more story yet to tell. And it begins with Mark's favorite Greek word immediately. 
when Jesus has done teaching and preaching and feeding, immediately he ushers the disciples somewhere private. Immediately he says goodbye to the crowd, and immediately he goes off alone to find somewhere quiet to rest and to pray. Friends, let it be so for you and also for me. Amen. Now, friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit sustain your life so that you may sustain others this day and every day forevermore. Amen.